Our scripture this morning is in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verses 23 through 31. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. Let's turn to the passage that Mitch just read. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 23 through 31. That's our passage today. As we continue our journey through the book of Hebrews. And today... We're going to see the faith of a murderer named Moses. And we're going to see the faith of a prostitute named Rahab. I think some people like to think that the Bible is two different books. There's two different gods at work. There's the God of the New Testament, who's a God of grace and mercy. But the God of the Old Testament was a God of wrath and justice Actually, no. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God has always been in the business of rescuing sinners. Got any sinners in the room rescued by Jesus this morning? Abraham, who's in the Hall of Faith, was an idol worshiper in the Ur of the Chaldees. Noah got drunk and undressed And he embarrassed himself in front of his family. Sarah laughed at God when he said she would have a baby in her 90s. You probably would have done that too. Jacob was a trickster. He deceived his father and his brother. Joseph was a prideful little cuss. That's why his brothers got angry at him and sold him into slavery. All of these men and women in Hebrews 11 are flawed and failure-ridden creatures. And even though we don't have explicit evidence in the Bible of Enoch or Abel sinning before God, let me assure you that they did. Because the Bible says that no one is without sin, no, not one, and all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Right? And if that discourages you or makes you uneasy, let me give you some good news in that. God saves only sinners. Isn't that good? That was true in the Old Testament. That was true in the New Testament. It's also true in San Antonio, Texas in 2023. In this room full of sinners that are only saved by grace through faith. Because you might ask, okay, well, God saves sinners, Pastor Tony. How does God do that? Does he do it by our good works? Does he save us by us being perfect? No, listen, listen, saints, that's not possible for the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. It's not possible for us to be perfect or for our good works to somehow blot out the sinfulness that we've inherited as, as the offspring of Adam and Eve. No, Look, we are saved, and I know y'all know this. We are saved by faith. We are saved by grace. Sola fide, sola gratia. Paul says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Right, church? You know, sometimes I like to wait till the end of a service to really preach the gospel and lead someone to Christ. I'm not waiting this morning. 
If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, what are you waiting on? God always saves through faith in the Old Testament and the New Testament. God can save you through faith. You might say, faith in what? Faith in what? Look, you believe, we believe in Christ's death as payment for our sin, and we believe in Christ's resurrection from the dead as victory over death. In that, we put our faith, we believe, and we are saved. Right, church? That's where our salvation is found. So back to this passage, Hebrews 11, 23 through 31. Let's talk about faith. Let's talk about the faith of a murderer and a prostitute. Write this down as number one in your notes. Faith in God is exemplified in four ways in our text today. Here's the first. Our faith in God is a faith that triumphs over fear. Our faith in God is a faith that triumphs over fear. The author of Hebrews says in verse 23, By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Now, the subject of the verb hidden is Moses, but it's a passive verb here, not an active verb. So the faith that's being demonstrated, at least in verse 23, is not the faith of Moses, it's the faith of his parents, his mother, Jochebed, and his father, Amram. And if you read the book of Exodus, you'll see that the book of Exodus doesn't start with Moses. It doesn't even start with Moses' parents. It starts with this despotic king of Egypt who, who utters this edict that all the Hebrew baby boys be thrown into the Nile River. Actually, even goes before that when he, when he recruits the midwives, the, the Hebrew midwives, and, and tells them to, to, to let him know so he can put these baby boys to get to death. And the midwives, famous for the work that they did, for deceiving even Pharaoh, Shifra, and Pua, they wouldn't stand for that. And Moses' parents wouldn't stand for that either, the, the killing, the murdering of these Hebrew baby boys. Why didn't they stand for it, Moses' parents? Because they saw that the child was beautiful. Now, let me explain that. Not beautiful in the sense that, you know, Moses was like baby Fabio or something. Like he had these high cheekbones and he was a, a male model in the making. No. The idea here is that Moses had a divine marker and was made for a divine purpose. That's actually a reference there to Exodus 2, verses 1 and 2, where it says, The woman, Moses' mother, conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. So the Hebrew word there for beautiful or fine is the word tov, which is generically just a word that means good, but it has a wide semantic range. It can mean delightful or precious. And the idea here is that baby Moses was precious, as all babies are in God's sight, but precious even for a specific purpose that God had destined him to rescue his people. He had a, he had a purpose that went beyond what a normal baby in that day would have. And the faith of Moses' parents. Look, our faith, there's this battle that goes, that, that's at work in our lives between faith and fear constantly. And, and one of the things that we're learning here from Moses' parents is that their faith in God outweighed their fear of the king and his edict. The faith of Moses' parents and the God of the universe dwarfed their fear of Pharaoh. Let me say it this way. They feared God rather than man. And that, that faith in God and their fear of God led them to preserve their child alive. And they hid that child for three months. Speaking of fearing God more than man, Jesus said this. He said, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Y'all heard this before? Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. The worst thing that people can do to you in this world, the worst thing that that Pharaoh could have done to them was kill them. But they, they can't touch this soul. That belongs to God. And because of that, faith in God ultimately triumphs over the fear of man. By the way, I'll just say this because we're dealing with an instance in the Old Testament where there was civil disobedience. These parents of Moses disobeyed the edict of the Pharaoh. So did those Hebrew midwives. 
And, and I'll just say, so, you know, you can hear your pastor say it this morning. There is a time for civil disobedience for Christians. There is. There's a time when our faith requires us to disobey governing authorities. You know, if doctors in our country are mandated to violate the Hippocratic Oath or to kill babies in the womb or to prescribe puberty blockers for children or to mutilate the flesh of healthy people, they must object to that. We must obey God rather than men. There's a time for civil disobedience. I mean, this is a room full of Texans, so we're all like, amen, yeah. I think we need examples in our day of people like Amram and Jochebed and Shifra and Pua. Now, now let me just qualify that just a little bit, okay? Because what do we see in Hebrews 23 and in the book of Exodus? You know, the faith that these Israelite people had, it, it wasn't a reckless kind of faith. They weren't running out in the street saying, we defy the Pharaoh, Here's our baby. No, it was wiser than that. It was shrewder than that. They hid their baby in their home and for three months. And then, you know, what happens with a baby? Y'all know this. Babies get loud, right? And so they had to come up with another solution. And the second thing that I'll, I'll just mention here about this, this work that they did is they did something unusual after that three-month period was over. They made a basket for this baby. They floated him down the river. There's no mention of that here as an act of faith. I'm not saying it wasn't an act of faith. I'm just saying there's no mention of it here. And yet God still used that act of this, these parents to preserve this beautiful baby by means of Pharaoh's daughter, which is just amazing to think how God orchestrated that sovereignly to bring up baby Moses in an Egyptian household that becomes strategic later when he leads the people out of Egypt. We'll get to that in a moment. Go ahead and write this down as number two. Our faith in God, first of all, it's a faith that triumphs over fear. Church, let me say this as well. It's also a faith that triumphs over comfort. It's a faith that triumphs over comfort. By the way, those who just, let me say this as well. There are those who preach what some version of what I'll call the prosperity gospel who are really sneaky, deceptive about this. They think that faith in God leads to creature comforts and leads to prosperity, when in fact, faith in God oftentimes leads to the jettisoning of creature comforts in order to obtain eternal rewards. We don't put our faith in Christ in order to be prosperous or to be comfortable in this world. God is not a genie in a bottle. It's not Christianity, that's paganism. And, and true faith in God triumphs over the human desire for comfort. Case in point, Moses in the Old Testament. Now, just, just a note of Bene here because, I mean, we can see examples of this in the New Testament. That, that comfort wasn't really what resulted from people who put their faith in Christ. You know, Paul was thrown into prison multiple times for his faith in Christ. He died a martyr's death. Peter was crucified upside down, according to church history. The apostle James got put to death by King Herod Agrippa in Acts 12. And not just in the New Testament, but in church history. The church father, Polycarp, was burned at the stake for his faith in Christ. Two Christian women, Perpetua and Felicity, were killed by wild beasts in the Colosseum for their faith in Christ. The second century theologian and apologist Justin Martyr was beheaded by the Roman Empire for his faith in Christ. And we don't have time to mention Jan Hus, Hugh Latimer, William Tyndale, Diedrich Bonhoeffer, Jim Elliott, and others. This is what bothers me about prosperity preachers. Do they even read the New Testament? Have they even read church history? And they talk about the Old Testament. They talk about the prosperity of Abraham. Let's talk Old Testament. Let's talk about Moses. Look at verse 24. By faith, here's Moses, when he grew up, when he was grown, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Why would he do that? Why would he give up that privilege? Because he was a Hebrew. He was a God-fearing Israelite. Even though he was raised in Pharaoh's household, he was nursed by his mother, 
And we see this in Exodus. And, you know, wouldn't you think that Mama Jochebed, as, as she was nursing and raising up Moses as he was growing up in this palace, would have told him about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? And would have said, okay, you might live in the palace with Pharaoh and his daughter, but you belong to us. You belong to the Hebrews. You belong to the God of the Hebrews. And therefore, in light of that, Moses, look at verse 25, chose rather to be mistreated with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Moses could have had riches. Moses could have had luxury. Moses could have had wives and mistresses and concubines, the pleasures of sin. Moses could have enjoyed the benefits of having slaves like the other Egyptians. He could have lived a life of luxury, rejecting God and the people of God that he ethnically belonged to. But he gave that up. Why would he give that up? Here's why, because of verse 26. Because he considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. He was looking to something better than the treasures of this world. Listen, church, this is an amazing verse, verse 26. Is everybody, everybody with me, verse 26? Don't move past this too quickly. He, Moses, considered the reproach of Christ. Y'all see that? Greater wealth than the treasure of Egypt. For he was looking forward to the reward. Now, three things about verse 26. This is the only place in the entirety of Hebrews 11 where Jesus or Christ are mentioned. Which is amazing to me because the author of Hebrews has spent 10 chapters talking about Christ. Christ is better, he's better, he's better, he's better. Christ, Christ, Christ. And then all of a sudden, Hebrews 11, it's like he goes radio silent on Christ. And he's just talking about faith, 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 faith. And then we have this little moment here. We have this moment when he's talking about Moses, when he says that Moses considered the reproach of Christ, that was, that was wrapped up in this Old Testament identity of, of following Yahweh. And it's just a little reminder here that Christ is in the background of all of this in Hebrews 11. He's in the background of all of this talk about faith with Old Testament saints. In fact, the author of Hebrews in chapter 12, he's going to draw a line between the faith of those Old Testament peoples and Jesus, our Savior. We'll get to that in a few weeks. So even though there's just an offhanded mention of Christ here, he's implicit all the way throughout Hebrews 11. The second thing I want to say about verse 26 is in reference to this, this statement, the reproach of Christ. What does that mean that Moses considered the reproach of Christ greater than the treasures of Egypt? What does that mean? That he was reproached. Like Christ. Well, the word Christ in Greek is Christos. It means the anointed one. It's synonymous with the Hebrew Messiah or Mashiach. And it has the idea here that Moses took on the reproach of the anointed one. He became, in a sense, a Christ like figure to the Israelites. He was a mediator between God and the people. And, and we've even seen that in the book of Hebrews because Jesus is better than Moses, he's a better mediator. But, but Moses was a kind of mediator between God and the people. And I'll just tell you, that was no picnic for Moses. He didn't want that job, but he got called to it and he brokered the release of the Israelites from bondage with Egypt. That wasn't a picnic either. He rescued the Israelites from Egypt. He was used by God to defeat the armies of Egypt, including their indestructible chariots and horses. We'll get to that in a second. Moses, he traipsed through the desert with the Israelites, listening to their belly aching and murmuring. That was no picnic for Moses either. And I wonder at times, as he was in the wilderness, if he thought to himself, maybe I should have just stayed in Egypt as a prince. So in that way and others, he, he shared the reproach of Christ. He was Christ-like in that way. And thirdly, let, let me just answer this question. Why would he do this? Why, why didn't he go back to Egypt? Why would Moses jettison the power and the prestige and the, and the treasures of Egypt for this? Why would he turn his back on his adoptive mother and the Egyptian family for, for 
traipsing through the wilderness with a bunch of whiny Israelites. I find that interesting because, I mean, I, I said, I wonder if Moses ever thought about going back to Egypt. We, we don't have any biblical evidence that he ever thought about that once. But you know who did think about going back to Egypt? It wasn't Moses. I mean, the Israelites were like, we had leeks and onions and cucumbers back there. Why'd you bring us into this wilderness? You know, they, why'd you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? They got graves in Egypt, Moses. They got these big old pyramids that are graves. Why'd, who were the ones complaining? It wasn't Moses. Moses never looked back. He never looked back. In fact, look at verse 26. Why, why didn't he stay in Moses? Why, why didn't he go back? Why didn't he pine after leeks and onions? Because he was looking forward to the reward. Did everybody see that in verse 26? There's no going back. We're going forward. Like, like Abraham, who we saw last week, Abraham Isaac, he was looking for the better country, something better than what this world has to offer. Now listen, this is why this is important for the author of Hebrews, writing to a group of, of Jewish Christians at this time. Because what are they tempted to do in that first century world? They want to go back. They want to go back. They want to go back to the, the life that they had before following Christ got so difficult. And, and this is this is really good of the author of Hebrews. He's saying, you, like, you guys love Moses so much? Moses didn't go back. He looked forward. He was looking forward to a greater reward that God had for him. And let me just read verse 26 again. And, and I want you all to think about a New Testament parallel to verse 26 in the words of Jesus. Okay, just... What does this trigger in your mind when I read this? Moses considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. What does that trigger in your mind in terms of what Jesus said? Here's what it triggers in my memory bank. You can read this on the screen. Jesus said, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Y'all heard this before? where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves, look forward, folks, to a better country. Lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is there, your heart will be also, says Jesus. So faith in God, it triumphs over fear. It triumphs over comfort. Go ahead and write this down as number three. It also triumphs over human power. Our faith in God is a faith that triumphs over human power. Let's talk about the Exodus. Can we? I love the Exodus. I've loved the Exodus ever since I first heard Charlton Heston Say to Yul Brenner, let my people go. Let's talk about the Exodus. Look at verse 27. By faith, he, Moses, left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Now, some people think that this is a reference to Moses when he left Egypt the first time to go to Midian, when he, when he got married and when he lived out there in the, the wilderness for 40 years. That's possible. But I honestly don't know how to square this with the statement in the book of Exodus where Moses was actually afraid of Pharaoh, and that's why he left. If you remember, Moses killed an Egyptian who had been persecuting a Hebrew, and then word started to circulate about what had happened. And, and you know, because of fear and because Pharaoh came after him, Moses had to hightail it out of Egypt. So I, I don't think this is talking about that leaving. But, but here's the thing. Moses had two leavings of Egypt. One leaving he came back from. The first one actually was in fear. The second one was in faith. So when I read, by faith he left Egypt, I don't see the first leaving, I see the second leaving. When Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt for good. Because when, the, when Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt during the Exodus, 
you know, he was supremely confident in the Lord. It took a while for him to get there, but he was supremely confident in the God of the Israelites. And with good reason, you know, because God, the God of the Israelites had unleashed these devastating plagues on the land of Egypt, and and their land was decimated by the time that he left. So Moses wasn't afraid of the king. He wasn't afraid of the Pharaoh he could see. He rightly feared the God who he couldn't see. Notice the, the irony in this statement in verse 27. For he endured, Moses endured, as seeing him who is invisible. He saw, so to speak, the invisible God. I mean, that, that reminds me of Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. He had more fear. He had more faith. He had more confidence in the king he couldn't king he couldn't see than the king he could see pharaoh and that's right that's right and moses left egypt with a bunch of israelites believing in this god whom he couldn't see I mean, there are these instances where moses saw a glimpse of god i understand that metaphorically speaking even there's that moment when god put moses in the cleft of the rock and saw some aspect of god's glory but y'all need to know that was just just some part of God's glory. No man can see God really and live. I mean, if, if Moses or any of us had seen God in all of his glory, we would have been, we've just been eradicated in that moment by the power of his glory. So yes, Moses in a way saw God, but in, in a more profound way, way, he endured as seeing him who is invisible. And Moses' faith continued. Look at, look at verse 28, by faith... He kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. Can you just, I mean, just put yourself, pretend you're an Israelite with me for a moment so many years ago. And, you know, Moses gives you this command. I want you to take lamb's blood, lamb's blood? Yes, lamb's blood. And and I want you to slather it on your doorpost. And if you do that, then the angel of death, when he comes by, he won't kill your firstborn. But if you don't, he will. Can, I mean, can you imagine hearing that for the first time and, and having to act in faith in light of what was communicated to you? I mean, it just it sounds ridiculous, but, but maybe it didn't to them because they had just seen God unleash all of these plagues on Egypt. So they're like, you bet I'm going to do that. Nevertheless, it was an act of faith. The ones, listen, the ones who had their doorposts smeared had their firstborn sons spared. And the ones who didn't, didn't. And by analogy, in New Testament fulfillment, we would say that the ones who are saved, followers of Jesus, are those who have put their faith in the blood of the Lamb. And they are spared from experiencing God's wrath and the penalty of eternal death. The ones who aren't, the ones who don't, won't be spared that. Look at verse 29. The faith continues. By faith, now look, look who believes here. We're moving on from Moses. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. Now, some of you, I know you all read Exodus 14. You've read about you know, the crossing of the Red Sea. And, and even as you read this, you're like, by faith? By faith? Yeah, right. The faith of the people? No way. They were whining and complaining. Maybe Moses had faith. You know, Moses split the sea, but the Israelites, they didn't have faith. Actually, they did. They didn't always have faith in the God their God in the wilderness, but they did then. Because God tells us, you can read about this in Exodus 14. It's, it's really interesting the way that this is framed. Because they had to actually step out onto that dry seabed. And the way it's described is that there were these walls of water to their right and to their left. And the Hebrew word used for wall is this word choma, which means tall, imposing, pillars. So th- and this wasn't like a dinky little shallow pond. 
These were huge walls of water on both sides of them. Now, and does that take faith to step out there and walk across the Red Sea? You could die at any moment. You could die at any moment. And they did it. And they did it with all of their children and with all of their possessions. And they crossed that Red Sea. And, and by the way, they put their faith in the Word of God, right? We've talked about this already. Not believing just some unbelievable thing, but God said, walk, and they walked. Did God tell the Egyptians to cross the Red Sea? No, he didn't. So for the Israelites, their stepping out and crossing the Red Sea was a step of faith. For the Egyptians trying to cross, that was presumption. God never told them to cross that Red Sea. In fact, God wanted the Israelites to get away from Egypt because he didn't want them to go back into slavery. So these Egyptians rushing out into the Red Sea is the opposite of faith. That's presumption, and because of their presumption, they died. The Egyptians, and I think that's why the author puts this in here in verse 29, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, they were drowned. They were drowned. Now let's do some theologizing here and just think this through. Because I, I know even as I, every time I go to the Exodus, it creates among Christians like this cognitive dissonance. And, and I get it because I've, I've talked through this with some of y'all. Because because you think about this and you say, okay, Tony, well, how does faith triumph over human power? How does that really happen? Because you just talked earlier about how some New Testament Christians are put to death because of their faith. And you talked about people in church history who, who died. How, how did they triumph over human power if they were put to death? And maybe you struggle too with this, this story of the Exodus. And you think to yourself, well, the, the Israelites got to cross the Red Sea. Why can't I cross the Red Sea? You know, why can't I go down to the Gulf of Mexico and karate chop that thing and split it and just walk right through it? The quick answer to that is because God hadn't told you that you can do that. And faith is not just some belief in some crazy thing. It's belief in God's word. And as it relates to the, the Red Sea, y'all need to know the distinction that theologians make between what's descriptive in the Scripture, Scriptures and what's prescriptive. Y all, y all, I've used these terms before. Some things are descriptive. Some things are prescriptive. And this crossing of the Red Sea, this is descriptive. This is not prescriptions for us as Christians to go karate chop bodies of water and go through them. But here's what is prescriptive about it, okay? And this, Paul said in 2 Timothy, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. All Scripture isn't prescriptive, but all Scripture is profitable. How is this profitable? God told the Israelites to walk on dry ground. They believed and they obeyed God's Word. What has God told us to do? What is God's Word to us? God has told us to put our faith in Christ we put our faith in the past work of Christ, his death and his resurrection. We put our faith now in the present work of Christ, the work of the Holy Spirit inside of us, and we walk by faith every day. And we also put our faith in the future work of Christ, his coming, his return. We have faith that is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not yet seen, right? That's God's word to us, and that's how our faith triumphs over human power. The faith triumphs over those who can kill our body, but they can't touch my soul. People in this world can take me out, but they can't take my soul. That belongs to Christ. And my faith in Christ does triumph over human power. I think some Christians, this, this is why I'm kind of drilling down on this right now. Because I see Christians all the time who struggle with what I call over-realized eschatology. Have I used that term before here? Just turn to your neighbor right now and tell them, over-realized eschatology. 
Christians who think that heaven is a place on earth now. I call this also the, the Belinda Carlisle complex. Because too many Christians think, ooh, heaven is a place on earth. <laughs> and they want it now. They want peace now. They want suffering to go away now. They want deliverance now. They want rest now. They want pleasure now. They want comfort now. They want sinlessness now. They want security now. They want hardships to cease now. They want tears to evaporate now. They want overrealized eschatology. They want heaven now. Can I just tell you all, Belinda Carlisle, she lied to you, okay? Heaven is not a place on earth. Not a place is presently constituted. We talked about that last week. There's a new heaven, there's a new earth, there's a new Jerusalem coming. And it's not here yet. And I see Christians struggle sometimes with, you know, why is life so hard for me as a Christian? What? Shouldn't it be easy? No. You were never promised that. You were never promised a cushy, comfortable Christian life. And sometimes trials and difficulties, those are a result of our faithfulness to God. And, and, you know, I was kind of picking on the prosperity gospel folks earlier, but I'll just tell you as Americans, there's a little bit of prosperity gospel that gets in all of our hearts. We think, you know, I'm serving the Lord. I'm doing all these things for him. Why is life hard? God should make it easier for me. No. God, you were never promised a cushy, comfortable, copacetic life. In fact, Jesus said it this way, speaking of promises. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. count on it. But he also said, I have overcome the world. And he also said, I'm coming back for you. And this world is not our eternal home. So we indeed, by our faith, ultimately will triumph over human power and live eternity, eternally with our Savior. Go ahead and write this down as number four. Faith in God triumphs over fear. It triumphs over comfort. It triumphs ultimately over human power. And finally, it, it triumphs over disobedience. So in verse 30, you know, we're following the Israelites, and now we're moving away from Moses. But we're still chronologically and historically now moving into the promised land. And they cross the Red Sea. They cross the Jordan River. And they're being led by Joshua into the promised land. And their first course of action in the promised land is to take this city of Jericho. And, and they're not, they're not going to do anything at all to conquer this city. All they're going to do is have faith in God. And the author of Hebrews says it this way, By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. And once again, God gives them this ridiculous command. I want you to walk around the city for seven days. I want you to do it once a day for six days and do it seven, time, seven times on the seventh day. If you're doing the math, that's 13 times. So they're, they're circumnavigating this city like NASCAR in the Daytona 500. Just trusting at the end of it that God's going to do what he says. And sure enough, God was good to his promises. And the walls fell, and they fell in such a way that there were ramps available to the Israelites to come in, conquer the city, and take the promised land. By the way, that's, that's a great moment of faith and obedience, but there's, there's disobedience all over the place in the Old Testament. And the original readers of this book, the Jewish Christians, they would have known that. I mean, Moses, Moses got barred from the promised land because of his disobedience. God said, speak to the rock, and he struck it instead. Moses' brother Aaron got barred from the promised land for his disobedience. A whole generation of Israelites died in the wilderness because they wouldn't believe God and conquer the promised land. Only Joshua and Caleb were allowed from that generation to enter in. Even after Jericho, so they destroyed Jericho. Even after that, there's this, this knucklehead named Achan who goes into Jericho and he takes plunder after God tells him, don't take any plunder. 
And he brings down destruction on himself and his family and some innocent Israelites as well. Listen, the Jewish Christians that the author of Hebrews was writing to, they would have known all of that, all of that background. They didn't need a history lesson on disobedience right here. What they needed was encouragement to believe and obey God's word, even when it's hard, even when it doesn't make sense, even when they're tempted to go back. And the great example of that, one of the greatest, is Jericho. The people of God believed. The city fell. May God be praised. There's also this amazing example at the end of this passage. You know, it's this list of 16 men and women who are recorded in the Hall of Faith. Who's the most surprising name in here? I'll... Yeah, I think so. She's, she's the most unexpected Hall of Famer in this list. And it's not just because she's a woman. I mean, that's surprising, but Sarah's on this list too. We talked about her last week. What's really surprising about Rahab is two things, her ethnicity and her profession. Look at verse 31. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who are disobedient. By the way, that's a reference, I think, to the wicked people of Jerusalem, the disobedient, the disbelieving. But you can add Achan to that mix as well. Actually, it's interesting if you read the book of Joshua because juxtaposed together, you have this woman, Rahab, with also this unfaithful Jewish person named Achan. And they're kind of put together. And here's this respectable Jewish man who disobeys God and gets destroyed. Here's this unrespectable Gentile woman who puts her faith in God and is saved. It's an amazing combination. Can I just say this in reference to Rahab? God is no respecter of persons. Jesus told the religious leaders of his day, truly I say to you that the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. Let me say it this way. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. And God is in the business of saving murderers and prostitutes and liars and cheaters and fornicators and sinful people. And the great example of this in this story, this, I mean, a lot of people like to go to Hebrews 11 and try to think like, who am I like? Who am I really like? I'm like Moses. Yeah. I'm like Abraham. You know who we're like? Room full of Gentiles? We're Rahab. We're Rahab. We're sinners. For the wages of sin is death, right? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But listen, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. One of the great things that Rahab teaches us from the Old Testament and the New Testament is that it, it doesn't matter whether you're male or female. It doesn't matter how sinful a life you've lived. It doesn't matter your race, your ethnicity. It doesn't matter which side of the tracks you grew up on. The ground is level at the foot of cr the cross, and anyone and everyone who puts their faith in Jesus Christ can be saved. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. Rahab, if you remember, she, she, she hung that scarlet cord outside of her window, and that was her sign of faith. And actually, it preceded that by her action. She housed these Hebrew spies that came into her, her house, and she protected them from harm. And Rahab said to the Hebrew spies in Joshua 2, verse 9, she said, I know the Lord. I know Yahweh has given you this land. That was her statement of faith. And the Apostle James also references Rahab letter, in his letter, and he speaks about her faith demonstrated through obedience. Rahab was unlike the other unfaithful people of Jericho. She, was, she wasn't like the Achans of the Israelites either, who were disobedient and unfaithful. And I want to say this as well about Rahab. You know, just one little verse in here. There's so much in that in verse 31. 
You know, Rahab was a prostitute when she got saved, but y'all need to know she didn't stay a prostitute after she got saved. Rahab, like others in the Old Testament era, she was of this group of Gentiles that came in to the nation of Israel. And, and she actually married a Hebrew and had Hebrew babies. How do you know that, Pastor Tony? It's in the Bible. Rahab, she's listed in the genealogy of David. She's the mother of Boaz from the book of Ruth. She even, brace yourselves for this, she's even mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1. Jesus has Gentiles in his genealogy, Pastor Tony? Yeah, he does. He has at least three. Ruth the Moabitess, Tamar the Canaanite, and Rahab the Canaanite. Jesus has a prostitute in his genealogy? Yes, he does. Wrap your minds around this. One of Jesus' ancestors was a madam in a bordello. She was a sinner. Can I let you all in on a little secret? All of the people in Jesus' genealogy are sinners. And isn't that good news for a room full of Gentile sinners? Jesus only redeems sinners. And you guys qualify, so good job out of you. We're going to celebrate and remember this in communion in just a moment. But before we do that, I want to read this a section of a hymn called Come You Sinners Poor and Needy. And can I encourage you as, as I get ready to read this to just prepare your heart to remember Jesus' death and resurrection through communion. This hymn was written by a pastor named Joseph Hart in the year 1759. And it goes like this. Come ye sinners, poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, love, and power. Come ye weary, heavy laden, lost and ruined by the fall. If you tarry till you're better, you will never come at all. I will rise and go to Jesus. He will save me from my sin. By the riches of his merit, there is joy and life in him. Ushers, if you would, let's prepare ourselves for communion. Pray with me, church. Lord, we are indeed a room full of sinners, saved by grace, saved by faith. And Lord, I never stop marveling at the mercy that you've shown us. How a sinner like me could actually be called a child of God, can be redeemed and restored to relationship with the God of the universe. Lord, all of us in this room have violated your laws by sin. We all should be condemned. And yet, God, in your goodness and in your love for us, you sent your Son 
to die on a cross and pay for our sin. Lord, we believe. We believe. We believe that Jesus is our Savior, that he died for us. And we remember you now. 